Electrostatics, energy in electrostatic fields. So first we'll discuss energy in terms of the potential. That'll lead us into energy in terms of the field. And then we can end it with a quick discussion about power and energy in conductors. First, energy in terms of the potential. So in the last lecture, we talked about potential difference. We applied an electric field and we talked about how much work it would take to move a charge from point A to point B. And we derived an expression for potential difference from that. And the potential difference VAB was VV minus VA, which was also the work divided by the charge that we moved. And so the conclusion is the total work was the charge times the potential difference. And so it had a very simple answer in the end. So here we have a collection of charges. Now these charges are putting forces on each other. And so they either want to push or pull. They have the potential to do work. There is energy in this assembly of charges. And so we need to ask the question, how much energy is in this ensemble of charges? We can figure that out by figuring out how much energy it took to assemble those charges. And we'll use the concepts of potential energy to do that. So first we'll start off with an empty region and we bring in our first charge. And so at first it'll be way out at infinity and we bring this in and place the first charge at position P1 and it has charge Q1. Well, right now there are no other charges to create fields to either pull or push on that charge. So the work it takes to move this charge into place is zero. Now, once that charge is there, that charge has a field. The next charge that comes in will either help or oppose that. And now we'll have a number for the work to do that. Now we bring in our second charge. We bring it in from infinity and put it at position P2. And of course it has charge Q. However, that first charge is already in place. It's putting out a field that's either opposing what we're doing or helping us do it. Either way, the work to place the second charge is not zero anymore. And in fact, we can use our simple equation to calculate this. The work to place that second charge is the charge of that second particle times the potential difference between these two points. So that's how much work it took to bring the second charge in. Now we bring in our third charge. We also bring this in from infinity and place it at position P3. And of course it has charge Q3. However, there's already two charges in place that are either opposing us or helping us. So we actually have the sum of two terms to account for. So the work it takes to bring in that third charge is the work it took opposing or helping the first charge and the work it took with the second charge in place. So we add these two together and that's the total work it takes to place the third charge. So what is the total work so far? Well, it's the sum of these three things and we add them together and we get this final expression for work. Now suppose we did the exact same thing, but in reverse order, we bring in the third charge first, the second charge second, and we bring in the first charge last. Well, we would get the exact same expression. We just swap the indices one and three. What we'd like to do now is add these approaches. So this is the expression when we added charge one, then charge two and charge three. That's the expression we got for the work. We then did it the other way around and got a different expression. We placed charge three, then charge two, then charge one. Now what we'll do is add these equations together. So on the left, we get two times the total work we've done and then our two expressions added together. Then what we'll do is we'll multiply everything out and then collect the terms on the common Q terms. So multiplying Q1, we have a V12 and a V13. 
multiplying Q2, we have a V21 and a V23. And multiplying Q3, we have our V31 and V32. Now what we can do is replace the V12 plus V13 with just potential V1. And we can do it with our other two terms as well. And now this really simplifies down. We have two times the total work we've done equals charge one times the potential at point one plus charge two times the potential at point two plus charge three times the potential at point three. So this is the equation we got from the previous slide. We divide both sides by W and we end up here. And that tells us the total work or how much energy is stored in that ensemble of three charges. And looking at that, it becomes obvious how we could extend this to many charges, any number of charges. So it's the summation of one half QV for all the different charges. That is the total energy that an ensemble of charges contains. And we did this from the perspective of potential difference. So once we know the energy contained in an assembly of point charges, it's straightforward to extend that to energy stored in charge distributions. So for an assembly of point charges, we just had the sum of one half QV, where one half QV is sort of like the energy associated with each, each point charge. So if we go to a line charge, rather than adding one half QVs, we're now integrating our charge density times V times DL. So this rho L DL, that's total charge in our little differential element. So that's this role of Q over here for the discrete summation. So Q times V and then the one half, now we're integrating this little differential point charge, if you will, over the length of the charge. And we can extend this to a sheet charge. Now our integral is a surface integral. And we can extend that to a volume charge. And I'll end this by saying the volume charge is really the only case here that is physically real. Everything else is just a mathematical simplification of the volume charge. It's simplifications we use a lot and they're very accurate, but the volume charge is the only physically real one. Now let's take a look at the energy just in the electric fields themselves. What we just derived, the energy in a volume, is one half the volume integral of rho V V dV. And so this rho V times dV is our differential charge. And so really this is integrating one half QV. So we had that as our energy for a volume charge. Remember Gauss's law from Maxwell's equation. So del dot D equals rho V. Well, we have a rho V here and we can replace it with a del dot D. And now we have an electric field term in our energy equation. Remember the product rule that we talked about in vector calculus and it said the divergence of a scalar times A when both of these are a function of position uh, equals this. And that was the product rule. So. If we replace F with V and A with D, we get this equation. Now what we would like to do is replace this expression in our energy integral. And so that's this term. So we'll solve our, our product rule, if you will, for that term. And that's what we get. So then what we can do is we can replace this del dot DV, replace that expression with these two terms. So there is our integral from the previous slide. We replace that expression coming from our product rule. And then we can divide this into two separate integrals. Remember the divergence theorem? This let us convert a surface integral to a volume integral. So if we have a surface integral of flux, that's equivalent to a volume integral of divergence. Well, in our first integral, we actually have a volume integral of divergence, 
And so that lets us write this as a surface integral of flux over a closed contour surface. So it's completely enclosing some volume. So we replace that triple integral with our double integral, the closed contour surface integral. So there's our equation from the previous slide. Let's take a closer look at this first integral and let's figure out how it depends on the distance r. So the potential we know decays with 1 over r. We know from earlier lectures that the electric flux density decays with 1 over r squared, r being the distance. And our differential surface area is proportional to r squared. Well, we're multiplying all of these together. And so the overall dependence is 1 over r. Now, it's a closed contour surface integral, and we're also free to choose whichever surface we want to. So what would happen then if we chose a surface that's approaching infinity? That little r then approaches infinity, and in fact, that whole integral approaches 0, because 1 divided by infinity is 0, and we're only left with the integral on the right side. So there we are, we're getting closer. The next thing we want to do is take this negative sign and bring it in and associate it with the gradient of the potential here. Does this look familiar? Remember the electric field intensity E is the negative gradient of the potential. So that is E. So in fact, the energy stored in the field is the volume integral of d dot e and differential volume. So that equation is valid for anything, for nonlinear media, for anisotropic media, inhomogeneous media, that is always valid. And you'll actually rarely see that in textbooks, but you'll see it here. There's a more common expression that you do find in textbooks, and if you Google this, uh, the equations that will come up. So in an isotropic medium, D is just simply the permittivity times the electric field. So we can replace D here with epsilon E. Now we have the electric field dot producted, if that's a word with itself. So the dot product of a vector with itself is the magnitude of that vector squared. And in fact, this is the equation you'll see if you do a Google search for energy in the electric field. But this is only valid in linear homogeneous isotropic media. Uh, in any other case, we have to go back to the original integral, which is, has the d dot e in it. So now we have two different expressions for calculating energy in the electric field. And this first one is general for any case, this other one only for LHI media. But remember, anytime a term has the word density in it, we said that there's this integral hiding behind it that'll add everything up to get the, the overall total. Well, we can look at this the other way around. We have an integral which calculates a total energy. That means whatever the stuff is on the inside of these integrals has to be the energy density. And so that's exactly what we conclude. So if we know the energy density, then we can integrate that to get total energy. And so that's how it's written here. And in fact, when I'm thinking about energy in the electric fields, I'm really thinking this way. I think of one half d, d dot e as the energy density, and this is what I'll integrate. Or for LHI media, maybe it's a little bit easier to do it this way. One half permittivity times the magnitude of e squared. So I'll usually derive an expression for that, which is the energy density, and then integrate that over the volume. Last topic, let's talk about power and energy inside of conductors, because now we have a current. So we have Joule's law. And from circuit theory, we know that power equals voltage times current. And so the electromagnetic equivalent of that is called Joule's law. We have an E dot J, that's our V times I. 
and we integrate this up and we get overall power. That must mean that this argument is the energy density inside of a conductor. So we'll write our little W again as E times J. And think of this as V times I from circuit theory. Now we have Ohm's law, the electromagnetic version of Ohm's law, J equals sigma E, where this is the conductivity. So here's our expression for the energy density. We can replace J with sigma E. We have another E having a dot product with itself and we'll get the magnitude of E squared. That's our energy density in a conductor. So we conclude the total power in a conductor, power being absorbed by the conductor, is the conductivity times the electric field squared, the magnitude of the electric field squared, that is the power density, and we integrate that up and we get the total power. So that's the power being absorbed from the electric field inside of a medium that is conductive.